This video is sponsored by Classic Football Shirts, the best place to get your classic and vintage football shirts. To get cheap retro palace shirts, click the link in the description below. And for an extra 10% off, use the code CFSPJ10 at checkout. Hello and welcome to the eCrystal Palace podcast. I'm Foster Greenberg and in today's podcast I'll be looking over the game against West Brom by bringing you my match review player rankings and my man of the match. As well as this, I'm also going to bring you interviews with Roy Hodgson and Junior Sproni after the game. So let's begin. A second away point of this season was enough to take Palace off the bottom of the Premier League table on Roy Hodgson's return to West Bromwich Albion. Following on from Tuesday's 0-0 draw at the Amex, the Eagles guarded the net for a second consecutive 90 minutes, this time with Junior Spurney between the posts after Wayne Hennessy sustained an injury in the warmer. The home side had the first chance of the afternoon when Jay Rodriguez's low cross just behind Harob Zucano was guided narrowly over the bar by the off-balance Welshman. Palace didn't threaten until the 13th minute when a neat passing move involving Luka Milivojevic, Andrus Townsend and Wilfried Zaha saw the latter have an effort blocked into the side netting that behind for a corner. Zaha had another effort blocked in 21 minutes which sailed narrowly wide of Ben Foster's goal, though nothing came from the resulting corner. The Ivorian continued to threaten, getting in behind the Baggies back line twice in quick succession and having two penalty shouts dismissed by Michael Oliver as the Eagles flourished in a revised 4-3-3 formation. A lively Christian Menteke had Palace's next good chance, turning three West Brom defenders and skipping past another challenge before having his shot turned behind for a corner. He then had two headers saved from the two resulting corners as he looked to get off the mark for the season. Julian Sproni made a superb save with his chest to deny Rodriguez after the West Brom forward wriggled three in the box, as both sides probed for the opener in the early exchanges of the second half. Sproni made another good stop with 20 minutes to go, powering a powerful Rob Sukarno shot from the edge of the area. Neither side had a real clear-cut chance to win it in the final 35 minutes, but both had spells on top. In the end, a point apiece was a fair reflection on the afternoon's action. It may not have been a classic, but a nil-nil draw at West Brom was enough to take Crystal Palace off the bottom of the Premier League table. The Eagles moved up to 18th with a point at the Hawthorns, with the result lifting Roy Hodgson's men above West Ham and Swansea City, but still leaving them in the relegation zone. So what do we learn from the game in the Midlands? Here are five things. Number one, Roy Hodgson is a popular man. The Crystal Palace boss is widely regarded as one of the nicest men in football, and has many friends in many places having had an illustrious career in management, both in England and abroad. And it's clear that he remains a popular figure at the Hawthorns, with the West Brom fans singing his name and giving him a warm reception on his return to the Midlands. Hodgson spent a season and a half with the Baggies before leaving to take the England job, and it was clear there was no animosity over his decision. He guided West Brom to a 10th place finish in the Premier League in his time in charge of the Baggies, and his achievements in his short spell with the club were recognised as the home supporters sang a rousting rendition of Number 2. Alan Pardew's record continues. Roy Hodgson was not the only manager facing his old club in this fixture, with Alan Pardew taking charge of his first game as West Bromwich Albion boss against the club that sacked him under just 12 months ago. He did not quite receive the welcome from his old club's fans that was awarded to Hodgson, but his side showed signs of promise and had better chances in the game. Speaking afterwards, Pardew said that he was pleased with his new side's performance, but disappointed not to win although he said that there was a cause for optimism for him that the Baggies will climb away from danger. And by avoiding defeat, Pardew continued his unbeaten record in his first game in charge of Premier League sides, with this being his fifth different club and the fifth time he has not tasted defeat, with three wins and two draws. Number 3. A day for the Palace stalwarts. Crystal Palace had a few players in their starting eleven who were regulars during Alan Pardew's time in charge. And it was two of them players who had been in the club for a number of years who stood out for the Eagles in a dogged defensive display. 
Despite only being drafted into the starting eleven with 25 minutes to go, Julian Spruny showed his professionalism with a solid performance in goal, whilst Joe Ward impressed at right back with a number of superb blocks to deny the baggies. He was Palace's standout performer on his 201st appearance for the Eagles and showed why he has been a regular pick for several managers during his time in South London. In addition, Martin Kelly, who also played under Alan Pardew, came in and put in a steady showing at the back to help Palace to a second consecutive clean sheet. Number 4. Benteke is getting back to his best. This was a much improved display from Christian Benteke, who was denied by Ben Foster in the first half as he fashioned a chance for himself with some fine footwork on the edge of the box before heading straight at the England goalkeeper. It was perhaps expecting too much too soon for him to hit the goal trail as soon as he returned from almost two months out through injury. But after substitute appearances against Everton and Stoke City, and 90 minutes against Brighton in the midweek, this was another step forward for the Belgium international. He now has a week to recover before two games in four days again, and Palace will be hoping that he can notch his first goal of the season sooner rather than later. And number five, the wait goes on. Palace may well have ended one unwanted record in midweek as they drew 0-0 at Brighton to record their first clean sheet in the Premier League season at the 14th attempt and they followed it up here with another to make it two clean sheets away from home for the first time since January 2015. But they have set another unwanted record, with this game taking a goalless run on the road to eight games this season, and ten in total when you include a 5-0 defeat at Manchester City and a 2-0 defeat at Manchester United last season. This has been the first time in history that a Premier League club has gone so long without a goal on the road, and the first time in the top flight since Manchester City in 1950, who went 12 games without a goal away from home. So I'm now going to move on to the player ratings, but before I start, don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Crystal Palace for all the latest Palace news. And also, if you're on Facebook, do feel free to join our Facebook group, which is a really great place to join in with discussions and share your opinion with other fans. Now, much like a forum, the Facebook group is a great place to upload videos, photos, and any other news articles you found online. So if you are someone who likes forums and likes sharing your opinion and reading what others have to say, about the game or about Palace in general, then of course do join the Facebook group because, like I've said, much like a forum, it's a great place to have discussions. And like I've said, it's not only you reading what others had to say, you can post what you thought about the game, you can post videos and photos, along with any news articles you find which are interesting online. So if you are someone who likes to share your opinion and read what others have to say, then do of course feel free to join the Facebook group. Now another great place to share your opinion is in the YouTube comments, so if you are listening to the podcast on YouTube, then do drop a comment below the video with your player ratings, rating the players from 1 to 10, with 10 being the best, and you can do this along with your views in the game. And the only reason I want you guys to do that is, not, is purely because, so I can see what you thought about the game. So whether you're a West Brom fan or a Palace fan, do comment below with your views so that I can come back to the video, see what you thought about the game, and any other fans, whether they be West Brom or Palace fans, Whenever they come to the video, they can not only just listen to my uh, my views on the game in the podcast, they can also read the comment section and see what other fans thought about the game. And whether it is you want to comment with your player ratings, rating each of the players, or whether you want to comment about what something specific within, uh, within the game, do feel free to drop your opinions in the YouTube comments below. And if I feel that there's a point to discuss within your comment, then of course I will reply to you and I do like the comments. So any comments you do post, I will like them. But if you are someone who likes to have your opinion heard and likes to give a counter-argument, let's say, to anything I say in the podcast or anything other fans have said, then do drop all your opinions in the comment section below. So if you want to follow any of these social media pages and join the Facebook group, then do feel free to check the links in the description below. But now to move on to the player ratings, starting in goal with Julian Sproni, who I am going to give an 8. Called into action half an hour before kickoff after an injury to Wayne Hennessy during the warm-up was ready to step up to the plate and had a solid first half, saving comfortably from Rondon's shot from distance. Made a huge save to deny Jay Rodriguez in the box at the start of the second half, which kept the game scoreless, and another from Rob Sukarni shortly after. Definitely took his chance today. So Julian Sproni here, I've given him an 8, and when you consider he wasn't actually me meant to even start the game in the first place, the fact that he came in literally last minute into the team, when you consider all of that confusion not you know starting the game the fact that he actually put in a really solid performance and I've given him an eight just proves how professional and how you know how much experience he's got the fact that even if he's called into the team last minute he can put in an absolutely solid performance now I said after the Brighton game that Wayne Hennessy after that game totally deserved to stay in the team and when I saw the teams announced for the West Brom game I had no 
you know, nothing against Wayne Hennessy. I thought, yep, he played well against Brighton. Fair enough, he keeps his place in the squad. But unfortunately, he obviously got injured in the warm-up. But actually, looking back at the game, maybe that was... I wouldn't say it's a good thing that a player gets injured. But, you know, the fact that Sproni had such a good performance, maybe that was just a blessing in disguise. And I, I believe it was just a back spasm for Wayne Hennessy, so it's nothing too serious. But obviously, he got taken out of the team. Sproni came in, showed how professional he was, was, used his experience, and actually put on an absolutely superb display. And in terms of, you know, being ready to step up, the fact that he wasn't in the squad, he was on the bench, and as soon as he got called up to the team, didn't let that distract him, got straight in with the job, and didn't let that distract him and put in a really solid display. And if you consider the first half, looking at the first half, obviously there wasn't much to do, but I suppose you could call the half solid because whenever he had to make saves or whenever he had to distribute the ball, he'd done that superbly. And then in terms of like the one big moment in the first half, Rondon had a shot from distance. Sperani was able to meet it and obviously, you know, get rid of the danger. So I, I believe from Rondon's shot, he saved it comfortably, so he was able to catch it. So that's just showing that not only is he solid overall, but a few moments in the game where these are really important saves, really good shots and really good chances for West Brom. The fact that he was able to save them comfortably just shows that he's still, even though he's really old, he's still got that experience in the team. And then in terms of the second half, obviously he made that save from Rondon in the first half. In the second half, a massive save from Jay Rodriguez. You know, Rodriguez running behind the defence was one-on-one -on -one with Speroni. Speroni made himself big, made himself big and was able to get in the way of the ball and obviously cleared the danger. So that was right at the start of the second half. And when you consider that West Brom, you know, the beginning of the second half, they looked more up for the game. Obviously had not had a team talk from Alan Pardew during half-time. West Brom came out slightly more energetic at the beginning of the first half. And the fact that you know, Speroni made that save, obviously kept the goal, the game scoreless, and eventually that's why we went on to get the clean sheet. But in terms of that save, fantastic, the fact that he ran off his line, made himself big, and obviously got in the way of the shot. And then shortly after that, Rob Zucanu also had a shot, and Speroni was able to save that as well. So not only was he making, you know, easy saves and easy, you know, catches in the first half, in his solid display, he was also making these three important saves, which actually, you know, kept us in the game. And when you consider... You know, goalkeepers, even any player really, but especially goalkeepers, when they come into the side, when they're not meant to start or they're not, you know, they were obviously not chosen to start the game, you know, they've got to take their chance. And Spurney definitely took that today. You know, he came into the side, showed why he should be starting the game because he made all these important saves. So really, Wayne Hennessy, although he played really well but against Brighton, Spironi's performance here against West Brom was even better. And certainly he took his chance. And so we're back to this point again where... Who do we play, Speroni or Hennessy? And based on this game, the fact that he made all these important saves, I'd say Speroni deserves to uh, deserves to start because he came in last minute and actually took his chance. But in terms of you know, in 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 terms of just his overall overall game and why I've given him the eight is mainly because of them blocks. So the one to deny Rodriguez, the one to deny Rondon and Rob Zucanu. So when you consider Jay Rodriguez was clean for on goal, made himself big, absolutely fantastic save. And when you look back at the replays. Not only did he come with his line quite quickly, he stood quite firm, so there was no way that Rodriguez was going to run around him. And obviously, he made himself big and blocked the shot. So stuff like that is something that we criticise Hennessy for. And against Brighton, he'd done that. But in this game, Speroni done it even better than Hennessy did in the Brighton game. And it was absolutely fantastic. And, you know, in terms of towards the end of the, end of the second half, it was quite a dull game, obviously, with it being nil-nil. And then towards the end of the game, there was quite a, a lot of, you know, important saves that he made. You know, they weren't fantastic saves, like the other ones I've already explained. But in terms of being important and keeping the game at nil-nil, I suppose them sort of saves towards the end of the game were quite important. But Julian Sproni here, at eight for him, I think is a fantastic result. And in terms of his, you know, keeping a clean sheet, I believe he's on 111 clean sheets now. And if he keeps another clean sheet this season, which hopefully he will if he keeps his uh, place in the squad, that will actually mean that he breaks the record for the most clean sheets as a Crystal Palace goalkeeper. So not only is he a legend for, you know, breaking the appearances, but also he's really, really close now, literally one game away from breaking a record for the most clean sheets. So hopefully if he gets his chance in the next few games, you know, Games against Bournemouth, Watford, Leicester, Swansea. These sort of games give Sproni the chance and hopefully he'll be able to break that record. But Julian Sproni here, an 8 for him, a great result. Now to move on to the right back Joe Ward, who I am going to give an 8. Given the task of keeping Jay Rodriguez quiet in the first half and young Sam Field in the second, did an okay job on both, including a superb block on an effort from the latter in the box at the start of the second half 
and another on the same man 15 minutes later. Like the Joe Ward of 2014. So Joe Ward here, I've given him an 8 and once again, much like his form has been, you know, getting better in the last few weeks, this game was absolutely a superb performance from Joe Ward. And obviously, that's why I've given him the 8. And if you looked across social media, you would have seen how people were raving up about his performances because it was absolutely superb performance. But in terms of how he started the game, his sort of task playing at right back was to keep, you know, Jay Rodriguez quiet. And then in the second half, when Rodriguez got taken off, it was Sam Field. So in terms of these two players, I thought he did an okay job of marking him. You know, he wasn't fantastic against them. You know, he wasn't necessarily stopping all of their chances from Rodriguez and Field. But in terms of saving a shot from Sam Field, there was obviously many superb blocks from him within the game. But there was one in particular where obviously Sam Field got into the box at literally right at the start of the first half. And Ward was able to, you know, get in front of him, make the block and clear the danger. So, you know, much like Spironi's saves that kept us in the game, kept the game at 0-0, Joe Ward's block from Sam Field at the beginning of the second half kept Palace in the game because if he had not have made that block and got in the way and cleared the danger, then we probably would have gone on to concede one goal. So in terms of that, it was absolutely superb. And then Sam Field had another chance uh, with about 15, 15 minutes after that one. So midway through the second half, same again, got in behind, went to have a shot and Joe Ward put his body on the line, got in the way of it and cleared the danger. So that them two blocks in particular and all of the tackles he made in the first half and second half against Rodriguez and Field were absolutely superb. And if you want a way to compare his performance to someone else or something else, I suppose if you think back to 2014 where Joe Ward was one of the best players for Palace, quite crucial to keeping us uh, in the league. You could say that actually this performance where Ward was winning all his challenges, his tackles, making blocks, this was much like what he was doing back in 2014. And when you consider how good his performance was, I personally would say now that he's one of the nominations for the Man of the Match. And all you have to do is look at Twitter to see how people are raving about him. Because, you know, I've said this already, but his performance was absolutely superb. And that's why I've given him the 8. And when you consider he's... You know, he's keeping Fossey Mensah out of the team and we've kept two consecutive clean sheets. So something must be working here. And personally for me, I think that the fact that Roy Hodgson is keeping the, the fullbacks quite simple now, making them not go as forward as they would have done beforehand and just keeping them quite defensive, keeping it simple. That seems to imp have improved both Joe Ward and Jeffrey Slut's performances. So long may it continue because Ward's performances at the minute were absolutely superb. But in terms of you know, his overall game, if you have to sum up why I've given him the 8, it's quite clear because of them two heroic uh, blocks, obviously, to deny Samfield uh, a goal on two occasions. But in terms of like an overall summary of the game, the, the main reason I've given him an 8 is because he was quite resolute in defence and he was quite useful. So he's putting himself about a bit, making tackles, making challenges and making it quite difficult for West Brom to break us down. But then in terms of going forward, the only downside of his, of his performance is probably... Going forward, it wasn't one of his best games. So although he was quite good in defence, quite useful, making blocks and tackles, unlike Jeffrey Slup, who got forward slightly more, obviously Joe Ward, obviously keeping his game simple, didn't go forward as much as he would have liked. But an 8 for him, an absolutely superb performance with him making tax and, block, um, tax and uh, blocks all over the field. And in particular, and the main reason I've given him the 8, is for them two blocks on Sam Field. Now to move on to the centre-back, Martin Kelly, who I am going to give a 7. A mixed first half. He nearly scored an own goal and let Jay Rodriguez in with a mix-up of the byline but recovered well to block the baggies forward. He lost a lot of headers to set pieces to Ghazi but was well placed to stop a few West Brom breaks. He was only playing after a late injury to James Tonkins but was rewarded with his first personalised chance from the Palace fans which was nice. So Martin Kelly here, I've given him a 7 and when you consider he hasn't actually played quite a lot this season, this was relatively a good performance from Kelly and when you consider he was involved, I believe, in the Bristol City defeat, you wouldn't really expect him to be anywhere near the first team but he came in and played in this game against West Brom, obviously was a late you know, came in because of an injury to James Tonkins and Scott Dan. So no one really expected him to start. But he started the game. And actually, I believe he didn't really do much wrong in the game. And actually, alongside Sacco, like what we saw last season, they were actually quite a good partnership and defended quite well uh, together. But in terms of explaining his first half performance, you know, it was quite a mixed first half. You know, in terms of scoring an own goal almost, you know, the ball came into the area. There was a lack of communication between Speroni, Saka and Kelly. So there was a bit of confusion. But Kelly, you could say he almost scored nine goal, but he cleared the danger. So the ball came to him 
and instead of faffing about in the box he just cleared it behind for a corner so you could say yes it's great that he's clearing the danger but you know if he had missed hit that it could have been a known goal so a bit dangerous there but a fa a, you know at least he got the ball out of danger and then in terms of a little bit of mix up you know with Jay Rodriguez he got in behind got to the byline but give credit to Kelly although he made that mistake he was able to recover quite well and obviously block the shot from uh, Rodriguez there so from the forward so in terms of you know them two mistakes you know he almost scored the own goal which you could debate actually he's got rid of the ball so that's great and then that mix up you know if if a player makes a mistake or a defender makes a mistake you don't just stop you continue to go with your man and like he did here he recovered quite quickly from that made the block and was able to clear the danger so that's what I like to see from defenders whenever they make a mistake or let someone get in behind they don't just stop and let the guy do it they keep with the man and much like what Kelly done here he was eventually able to get the block there but um, you know in terms of that that was a, a great piece of piece of defending from him not the fact that he got lost the ball in the area but the fact that he was able to recover quite well and then in terms of set pieces you know Higazi great physical presence for West Brom he lost quite a lot of headers and set pieces you know with Higazi probably being a, a better header of the ball so you can expect Kelly not to play fantastic against him but although he wasn't great at defending set pieces ultimately there were other players around him to cope with that but then in terms of making tackles and stopping West Brom attacks he was great at that so although he wasn't really doing well at set pieces whenever West Brom were on the counter attack he was able to you know get there and actually break up and stop their few their few breaks forward so in terms of that I thought in terms of stopping their attacks he done really well and when you consider it was a nil nil draw you've got to give credit to the defense of both teams because I thought not only the Palace defense but the West Brom defense did defend quite well in the game now like I've said already I've mentioned it the only reason he was in the team was because James Tompkins and Scott Dan uh, both were injured but because of Martin Kelly because of his performances at the tail end of last season his performance here again the Palace fans actually gave him his first chance which was, which was actually quite nice you know I wasn't actually at the game but hearing a chant for Martin Kelly when you consider how good his performance was here I think you know got to give him credit because it was quite a, quite a good chant you know something else for the Palace fans to sing and actually you've got to sometimes reward players although you do criticize them a lot I suppose Martin Kelly on this performance but also at the, the end of last season he does deserve a chant so great for him not only because of his performance but also the fact that he's now finally got a chant but the main reason just to go over why I've given him a seven you know although he did make a slow start to the game and he you know when he was at set pieces he could have been tighter marking but other than that I thought as the game went on he grew into the game and actually in terms of the second half he was absolutely composed in the second half his performance in the second half was absolutely fantastic in the fact that he was able to stop West Brom from getting forward and the fact that he was able to make these challenges and blocks is just credit to how well he's been performing so this is what you want from a player you know much like Speroni who came into the side and took his chance you want exactly the same from Martin Kelly who hasn't played a lot this season but he came straight back into the side and actually you know put in a really solid performance so if James Tompkins is going to be out for a few weeks maybe the same with Scott Dan I don't see based on this performance any problem with having Martin Kelly as the centre back because like I've mentioned already he actually plays quite well in a partnership with Mamadou Sakho but Martin Kelly here a 7 for him. Now to move on to the captain and centre back Mamadou Sakho who I am going to give a 7. Managed not to tackle the referee this time which was actually a bit of a shame. Wasn't given a whole lot to do but managed to mop up and win a few headers. Could have scored but had a header from a corner deflected just wide in the first half. Great last ditch tackle to stop the baggies break in the second half. So Mamadou Sakho here I've given him a 7 and much like his performance against Brighton midweek and against Stoke last weekend it was actually quite a solid performance from him and when you consider the last three games he's been given you know the captain's armband I personally don't think I'm not going to put all the praise on him but I don't think it's a coincidence that when Sakho has been made the captain we've gone on a a three game winning streak uh, not a winning streak a uh, lossless streak so we've been unbeaten in four games and three of those have been with Sacco as the uh, Sacco with the captain so in terms of captain in, captain in the side he's obviously having an impact and influence on the team the fact that we haven't actually lost in three of the games in our four game unbeaten run but in terms of his performance here you know much like Kelly he was making tackles making blocks and actually although he did make the tackles and blocks that he needed to West Brom didn't really give him a lot to do but in terms of the few chances that West Brom had he was able to mop up their chances so 
you know, if they're going on a counter-attack, he was able to break that attack up. And then also, in terms of being an aerial threat, when defending, if the ball, you know, West Brom were putting balls forward, Saka was able to win them headers and get the ball out of danger. So not only was he sort of mopping up and stopping their attacks, he was also being their aerial threat, which Kelly wasn't, and actually clearing the dangers there. Now, in terms of headering, not only was he using it good defensively, he could have scored from a corner, so the ball came in. I believe it was from Andrus Townsend, who was taking set pieces this game. Obviously, Sacco got his head on it, and it went just wide. It deflected just wide, and that was sort of in the first half. So he not only was defending well with his feet and with his head, he also could have scored, you know, great header. Unluckily, it went just wide, and that was in the first half. So he started the game. Uh, quite well and in, in terms of the second half although he didn't have too much to do in the game there was one tackle in particular you know a last ditch tackle which stopped the baggies on the break and that was you know midway through the second half West Brom were on the counter-attack and the fact that Sacco can make that tackle to stop the counter-attack and stop the attack and you know stop West Brom from creating anything is absolutely superb and when you consider Kelly you know he made them blocks and Joe Ward made them blocks and tackles. You know, Sacco didn't have to do as much because he didn't really have a lot to do because West Brom weren't that offensive. But that one chance that West Brom went to go forward, Sacco was able to stay stay strong and, you know, make that fantastic ta uh, that tackle. But in terms of his overall, you know, his, his overall game and the main reason I've given him a seven, you know, when you consider he's captain of the side for the third time in the Premier League and obviously... You know, that didn't really affect his game. So he's someone who's a born leader, doesn't seem to affect him playing. So unlike someone like, say, Scott Dan when he's the captain, that sort of downgrades his performances. Whereas here, Mamadou Sacco as the captain, third time in the Premier League, like I said, unbeaten in his games as captain. And as usual, didn't really affect his game. And it was he had such good composure in the game. So against Stoke, there was a few times where he took the ball out of defence and lost it and didn't really have that great composure. But what we've seen against Brighton and West Brom here is actually he's now starting to be a little bit more careful on the ball and showing a lot more good composure in the game. And in terms of the main reason I've given him a seven is that, you know, he much like Kelly and Ward, there was quite a lot of important interceptions that he made within the game, which obviously stopped West Brom from finding a way to actually get through a goal. So Mamadou Sacco here, I've given him a seven. You know, it was a great performance from him. You know, he captained the side fan fantastically well. Obviously, he didn't have too much to do because West Brom didn't really threaten. But when he had to, he was able to make tackles and obviously these important blocks, which obviously stopped West Brom from going forward. But a seven for him, I think, is a fair result. Now to move on to the left back, Jeffrey Slop, who I am going to give a six. His regular solid six performance. Not great, not terrible, with no defying moments either way. He's like a tin of Ron Sill. You know what you're going to get, but don't expect any more. So Jeffrey Slup here, I've given him a 6, and much like something that I keep saying every week, this is sort of a normal, average, solid performance from Jeffrey Slup. You know, he's one of these players that every week I give him a 6 purely because he's not great in the game, doesn't do anything spectacular, but he does his job and isn't really terrible. And when you consider, when you look back at the West Brom game, I thought that this game was exactly that. He's sort of his regular, solid 6 performance, you know. In terms of, you know, going forward and, and defending, there was no sort of defying moments, there was no times in the game where I thought that was a fantastic tackle or that was a fantastic cross so really you know he'd done everything right in a game so he didn't make any mistakes but then he wasn't great as well so there was a few times where he could have gone forward where he couldn't have and then there was also a few chances where he went back and actually made a tackle and there was a few times where he missed tackles so really it was an overall quite an average game from him so really he's one of the players that there isn't really much to say about his performance purely because we know what we're always going to get. We're going to get a solid average performance from him where he, you know, defends quite well, does what he have to, has to do defensively and occasionally ventures forward. But really, we don't expect any more. So we don't expect him to actually go forward and score goals and to put that clinical cross into the area. We just expect him to put in a solid uh, defensive performance. But in terms of the second half, he started off quite quite good against Hull Rob Zucanu. But obviously, as Rob Zucanu got into the game, he didn't play as well, but I thought he started the second half pretty good, or he started really well against Rob Zucano. But then in terms of going forward, and like I've mentioned already, although he was obviously limited to keeping Rob Zucano quiet, he was still limited in chances to go forward. And that's the thing I think he needs to add to his game, because he's got the pace, he's alright at crossing, not great, but if he can get forward a few more occasions and still make sure he can mark his man, i.e. Rob Zucano in this game, 
I'm sure that he could, you know, have an even better performance because I'm talking about his performances being sort of regular and average. But if he was to venture forward more often and still, you know, mark his man, i.e. Rob Sukarno, he'll he have even better performances. But in terms of, although he limited limited himself going forward, I still thought he remained disciplined at the back. And because he had that discipline and made sure he didn't put himself under pressure by going too far forward, I thought he did quite well against Har Rob Sukarno. And obviously, Rob Sukarno had a few chances. But overall, I think Jeffrey Slup dealt with that threat quite well. So Jeffrey Slup here, a six for him, your normal average performance from him. Now to move on to the defensive midfielder, Luka Milivojevic, who I am going to give an 8. Palace's best player in the first half, winning almost everything, keeping possession well and generally bossing it. Didn't, too, didn't do too badly in the second half either. So Luka Milivojevic here, I've given him an 8. And much like the performance of Joe Ward, in the first half, he was absolutely fantastic defensively, you know, making tackles, making blocks. And in the second half, was absolutely the same. You know, there was, in the second half, Joe Ward obviously made them blocks. And in the second half, Milivojevic, he done really well to win almost everything in front of that back four. And actually going forward, I thought he done really well as well. So if you were to compare two players' performances, I thought that both Luca and Ward played superbly throughout the game. And they both had good games either side of the half. But in terms of the first half, you know, Joe Ward was the best player in the second half with them blocks. Milivojevic... Milivojevic was the best player in the first half and in terms of playing that defensive midfield role I thought he won almost everything so whether that be getting putting in a tackle and a challenge to get the ball off West, uh, West Brom whether it be he'd intercept a pass whatever it be he'd win almost everything he'd done really well at keeping possession so in terms of you know if he had the ball was drive forward and he wouldn't just pump it forward if he couldn't go forward he'd pass it back and we'd build up again and, you know, there's a few times where he's actually pretty good at finding a pass out wide. So he'd done really well at, you know, keeping possession. And generally, he just bossed it. He was absolutely, like I said, the best player on the field in the first half. And if you look at it, he was completely controlling the game. And the word I like to use is, you know, or I like to say that actually, if you win the midfield battle, you win the game. In this game, obviously, we didn't win it. But, you know, in terms of winning that midfield battle, Milivojevic absolutely bossed it because he controlled how the midfield of both teams played but in terms of this second half was much the same as his first half performance didn't too do didn't do too badly a pretty solid half uh, from him but in terms of just overall his game you know i could go on and talk for ages about the tackles the blocks he made but it was another solid performance you know and in terms of something i really like about his game is that when he's in possession he, he's obviously really composed can keep the ball and make a tackle to win back possession but the thing I'm starting to see in his last few games and something that since Roy Hodgson has come in, I've seen more of it. is the fact that he's now putting, you know, putting forward effective forward passes. So not only is he being that defensive rock and protecting the back four, he's now actually picking up the ball from his tackles and actually putting balls forward to the likes of Zaha, Loftus-Cheek and Andrus Townsend. So that's something which I really like about his game is that he's not only playing defensive now by actually picking up the ball and spreading it he's now actually finding a pass to actually you know start up attacks and that's something I really like about his game and you know other than his defensive play for that passing alone and for generally bossing it that's the main reason I've given him an eight but in terms of his whole his whole defensive play I've already mentioned it absolutely solid defensively making tackles making blocks and that sort of capped off what was an, uh, another fine performance you know we've known since Luca's come to the club last January he's put in Fantastic performances every game, having a few off games here and there. But in this game again, he absolutely bossed it again. And hopefully in the next few games, with him, you know, with Kabai hopefully coming back into the team, with Loftus Cheek now being moved back to the middle, hopefully with our you know, starting with our stronger team, Luca can become better. Yeah, become better and better because at the moment he's playing really, really well. But hopefully in the next few games, playing alongside Kabai again and the fact that we we need to start taking our chances if we get on the end of say some of his passes going forward we're going to have a lot more goals because he's creating chances now not only defending but he's also creating chances so hopefully if we can start finishing off some of these chances then hopefully the whole team performances are going to improve in the re in the next few weeks but in terms of his performance here i've given luca an eight absolutely solid first half and an absolutely almost identical second half display very solid defensively and in this game was able to find a good effective pass going forward. But a good game from Luca again. Now to move on to James McArthur, who I am going to give a 6. 
Some nice tackles to break up the play at the important moments for the Eagles. As one of the two players in the central midfield with Milivojevic, more adventurers going forward from MacArthur would certainly help the team in the final third. So James MacArthur here, I've given him a 6, and much like some of the things I mentioned with Milivojevic, I thought in terms of winning the midfield battle, MacArthur done his bit to make sure that we controlled the game, especially in that midfield role. And in terms of similarities between him and Luca's performances, you know, I thought MacArthur put himself about a bit, you know, made some nice tackles. And in terms of, you know, West Brom attacking, there was quite important times where MacArthur or Milivojevic would come in there, make a tackle, and that is an important time because in a game, if you're letting the other team attack, you need to make sure that you stop the attack straight away and make that tackle. And I thought that MacArthur, on quite a lot of occasions, broke up that play at quite a lot of important times. And in certainly, playing alongside Milivojevic, you know, I talked about Kabai being the better partner for Milivojevic. But in this game, a partnership of MacArthur and Milivojevic, you know, did look, did look like quite a good partnership. And when you consider we look much better with Kabai in the team, MacArthur still came in and still done quite a good shift and when you consider how good uh, kabai has been of lately I thought MacArthur came in and, and you know had a respectable performance but in terms of his role in the team in comparison to Milivojevic MacArthur was more, a little bit more adventurous going forward so he was one of the players that was allowed to go forward and have chances but in terms of helping us in the final third it would have been you know more helpful for MacArthur to be a little bit more adventurous so although in terms of the two midfield players he was the one further forward it still would have been better to see him go forward a little bit more and offer an extra outlet when attacking so in terms of our attacking play we had Wilf and Benteke up front it would have been nice to see maybe MacArthur going behind so he could get on the end of a cross or get on the end of anything else that was kind of you know get thrown into the box whether that be Milivojevic's long balls or whether that be, you know, crosses from Loftus Cheek and Andros. So it would have been nice to MacArthur for him to obviously go up behind and support the attack. But in terms of his overall defensive performance, because he wasn't necessarily too attacking, it didn't really affect his overall performance. And if you really want a way to describe his performance, it's much like Jeffrey Slup. You know, if you heard what I said for Jeffrey Slup, I said it was quite a solid performance from him, but his average six. And MacArthur is one of these players who's very consistent, always seems to put in a 6 out of 10 performance, you know, and in terms of this game, comparing him to Slop, I thought they had a really similar performance, and that's not to say that both players were identical, and they both done the same job, but I thought in terms of comparing their performance, I thought it was very similar, and then both Jeffrey Slop's and MacArthur's performances were quite average, so there was nothing spectacular that they'd done, i.e. one of these last ditch tackles, but in terms of you know, playing in that midfield and winning that midfield battle, I thought he'd done an alright job there. So, James MacArthur here, I've given him a 6, comment below with what you think, but I thought playing alongside Milivojevic in the central midfield role, they formed quite a good partnership, and although he did, you know, make some nice tackles here and there to break up the play, there were still a few chances where if he had gone a little bit more adventurous, he probably would have helped the team in the final third, but a 6 for MacArthur, I think is a fair result. Now to move on to Ruben Loftus-Cheek, who I am going to give a 7 was way more effective once he was moved into the middle, but still lacked a little bit of a cutting edge. A few times shots were on from distance, but he still wanted to take another touch. Did well at keeping play ticking over and carrying the ball upfield, and set up a good chance in the near post with a burst into the box, but just missed that little bit extra today. So Ruben lost his cheek here, I've given him a 7, and much like some of his performances have been this season, this was one of his more better games, and although against Brighton midweek he weren't playing that well, he came into this game against West Brom and probably, you could argue, was probably one of our best attacking players. And in terms of playing in the game, when he was playing out wide, he was quite ineffective. But as soon as he was moved down the middle, that's when his game sort of opened up. And actually, as soon as they made that, Hodgson made a little tactical change, he actually, his performance improved quite a lot. And, you know, I did mention this last week that Loftus-Cheek, his skills and his attributes are wasted out wide. We saw that in this game here again, that when he was playing out wide, weren't playing that well and although he took on a few plays nothing was really coming of his attacks but as soon as he was moved into a central position he improved drastically and, and in terms of improving that's all great and he's really good at carrying the ball forward and actually you know keeping play ticking over and you know keeping control of the midfield that's all great but he still lacks that little bit of a cutting edge so there's a few times where he got into good positions but he, ha he didn't ha quite have that quality to get the goal or to get an assist and there was quite a few times where 
he was on the edge of the box. You know, some could argue, yes, he should have passed it out wide and got a cross in. But actually, he's got the ability. We know it's, he's got that. So if he wants to take a shot from the edge of the box, just do it. Because he's not being selfish. He's seen that he's in a good position. We know he can shoot from distance. So he should have, you know, should have taken that. And there was a few times within the game where actually he could have had shots from distance. Because there wasn't really any real options out wide. And if he had done that, if he had, you know, taken them shots from distance... He may even have scored. And even if he didn't score, we'll probably be praising him for at least trying to score and actually get a shot on goal. And in terms of having them chances, it wasn't the fact that he just, you know, didn't shoot. It was also the fact that he could have shot, but he was taking too many touches. So that's something that as he develops into a better player, whether it be at Paris or he goes back to Chelsea, the more he plays, the more he develops his game. And things like taking too many touches, then things will sort of go out of his game. But in terms of his, his performance here, yes, he was good once he moved down the middle. But there was still a few times where, even some may argue it's selfish, he probably should have taken a shot because that would have been uh, better for the team. But in terms of what he'd done well in the game, I thought he kept the game ticking, he kept the game flowing. And although it was quite a boring nil-nil, I thought he'd done really well. You know, carrying the ball forward, so creating chances. And the only time he did carry the ball forward was when he was playing down the middle, which once again just highlights the fact that he needs to be playing down the middle. Now in terms of one chance that he did set up when he ran down the middle, there was one chance where he ran into the box, burst of pace, no one was really around him, had a shot I believe it was, but nothing really came of it. So that just shows that actually offensively when he's playing down the middle, he can actually run into the box and create chances. But much like the thing that he's been with him quite a lot this season is that although he's really good offensively and creates chances, he still sort of lacks that little bit of extra, a little bit of cutting edge. So in this game, if he had a little bit more, I wouldn't say confidence, but if he had more trust in himself to actually take these chances with the few chances he actually got for a goal, he maybe would have got a goal or an assist from them. But in terms of the main reason I've given him a seven is because he's continuing his good form. So we've seen that since the England game, He's been performing really well and when you consider he's had an injury in between that, that hasn't really affected his game. But in terms of the main reason I've given him a, given him a 7 is purely because of his driving runs forward. So even when we lost possession in our own half, he'd run and get the ball and certainly, you know, it, he helped the team out. So although, you know, he was making these driving runs, getting creating opportunities for us, that's great. But there were a few times where he lost possession and that's purely because... Me looking at the game, he's playing out wide. That's not his natural position. So that's the only really downside I could say about his performance is the fact that although his driving runs really helped us when he was playing down the middle, when he was playing out wide, he lost possession quite a lot in his own half. And obviously that didn't help the team. But the thing that did help the team was obviously his driving runs going forward. But lost a cheek here, a seven for him. Once again, continuing his good form in the red and blue shirt. In this game, as soon as he was moved down the middle, improved drastically. So in the next game... Roy Hodgson, I know you're probably not listening to this, but you need to play him down the middle if you want to utilise his skills. Now to move on to Andros Townsend, who I am going to give a 6. Now to move on to Andros Townsend, who I am going to give a 6. Lots of running, a few crosses, but not much in terms of final ball. You could copy and paste this from half his game so far this season. So Andros Townsend here, I've given him a 6, and much like the performance of James MacArthur, and the one of Jeffrey Slup. This was quite an average performance from uh, Townsend. And when you consider the goal he scored last season against West Brom, you know, the fact that he ran the whole length of the pitch and scored, you would expect him to be quite fired up for this game. And although he didn't have a terrible game, I don't for think his performance was up to the standard that his last few games have been. But in terms of his performance here against West Brom, you know, this is something we've seen a lot this season. You know, there's lots of running from him. So he, he has the determination to get something from the game. There was not a lot of crosses. So when you consider we've got a target man like Benteke in the box, there weren't an, enough crosses to actually get to Benteke. And then in terms of final ball, we know he likes to shoot. But for some reason in the last few games, and especially this season, he doesn't really want to shoot anymore. And much like what I said with Loftus-Cheek, I'd rather him shoot from the edge of the box and it go just wide rather than him just taking a few too many touches on the box uh, on the edge of the box and the chance goes so in terms of his performance here he had the, his mind was in the right place in the fact that he was having lots of running you know putting in a few crosses but he didn't have that final ball so whether that be looking for that perfect cross or whether it be looking for that final shot 
you didn't really have that in this game and you know I described it as saying you could probably copy and paste this performance from half the games this season and that's something from Townsend you know he's one of these players who's always committed always is given 110% for the team always running and in terms of this performance something which is we've seen quite a lot this season is although he has a determination and he keeps running he doesn't have that final ball and you could probably copy and paste that from over half the games this season so we've played 15 games you could argue maybe seven eight of those games Townsend's performances have been exactly the same where he's had the determination but nothing's really come off of it and in terms of you know describing the game I've given him a six not because I thought he had a bad game or a fantastic game like I've said with MacArthur and Slup completely average game from him you know he struggled for quite a lot of space in the game and obviously that's because West Ham or West Brom sorry were playing quite well defensively and obviously they've got Alan Pardew now so that will probably be destroyed but they played well defensively but obviously he was quiet all game and you know I've said this already although he works tirelessly he was still quiet on the game and obviously in terms of final ball I said that he didn't really have much but there was one chance he had and he sailed it over the bar so that's just showing that overall it wasn't quite his game for him it wasn't quite his day but he's still sh showing signs that actually he's got his attitude in the right place he's doing what he want he can for the team but it's not quite clicking for him at the moment. And like with any players, they go through patches of form and they're not fantastic. And obviously this game is just Townsend's uh, patchy spot because really he's, his mind's in the right place and he's doing the right stuff on the pitch. It's just that that final ball and them crosses aren't really coming. But a six for him, I think, is a fair result. Now to move on to Wilfred Zaha, who I am going to give a seven. Could have easily have won a penalty in the first half when he was clipped by Higazi in the box but was rightly not given one when Ben Foster tried to round him earlier on when there was a tangle of legs and arms. Spent most of the first half running into plays, but improved after the break and putting numerous excellent crosses into the box. So Wilfred Zaha here, I've given him a 7, and unlike the performance of Andrew Townsend where he was quite an average performance, in this game, in terms of our attacking threat, you could argue that Zaha was probably one of the best attacking threats going forward. And much like his performance against Brighton where it wasn't fantastic, Compared to Townsend, at least Zaha had a few attacking chances on goal. And whether that's be having shots or, you know, getting an assist, he at least had that end product in the game. Now, in terms of his performance as a whole, you know, you could argue that in the first half, he was clipped by Higazi in the box and could have had a penalty. You know, I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but decisions like this are what are going to cost us at the end of the season. So if we end up getting relegated and it's two, three points in it, you know, you're going to look back at the Everton game and go... Well, that goal was a dive, or that penalty was a dive, so really that shouldn't have counted. We should have won that game. You know, you look back at this game here and go, actually, we could have won this game 1-0 if we had been rightly given that penalty. So I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but, you know, referees need to pick up their consistency because ones like this, which is a clear penalty, not like it was a dive, it was absolutely clear that he got clipped by Higazi. Absolutely clear, in my opinion, that is a penalty. So... If we do end up getting relegated because of two, three, maybe four points, we'll look back at decisions like this and actually question referees. But there was another one, and I've heard quite a lot on Homestead Radio, a lot of discussion about it. I don't really, I haven't read too much into the rules, so I'm not exactly sure how exactly it works. But obviously, Ben Foster, much like what Speroni tried to do against Everton, obviously, Ben Foster tried to take the ball around Wilfred Zaha. In doing so, he's tripped over his own feet. The ball's trickled out to Zaha. Obviously, Ben Foster's tried to hit the ball uh, away, and obviously, hands and feet have all got tangled up, and Zaha's fell in the box. I'm not quite sure whether, you know, professionals would call that a penalty, whether ex Premier League referees would say that. But personally, I haven't read too much in the rules to say that. But based on what I've heard on Homesdale Radio, it's not, you can't really give it. It's probably an indirect free kick, purely because, you know, Zaha's obviously got tangled up with Forster, and Forster's obviously tripped him up in the box but obviously not intentionally obviously he's trying to get the ball so in terms of them two chances the first one by Higazi definite definite penalty definite penalty but the one against Ben Foster there's quite a lot of debate about it so if you do read up on the rules and do find some little details do comment below in the comment section whether you do think that was a foul on Wilfred Zaha so now to move on to his first half performance and much like what Andres Townsend was doing quite a lot throughout the game in the first half, Zaha was basically running all over the pitch, so he had that determination to obviously get forward and try and create chances. And when you consider he was our best attacking threat in the game and our best outlet, you'd expect him to be one of the players running quite a lot. But obviously, because West Ham, West Brom, sorry, were playing quite deep, obviously being an, a 
being an ex Pulis team, they were playing quite deep, quite good defensively. So really, Zaha, although he was running quite a lot in the game, he was often running into players purely because of how good defensively West Brom were. But then after the break, much like quite a lot of the players, you know, after the break they improved drastically. And something which I saw from Wilf that I didn't see in the first half is that as soon as Roy Hodgson moved him out wide, moved Lost the Sheep down the middle, yes, the whole team improved as a whole. But actually, Zaha was started to put in excellent crosses into the box. And personally, I think we should have started the game with a 4-3-3. Not only because I think that Wilfred Zaha is a winger, so he needs to be playing out wide. But also because it means that Loftus-Cheek plays down the middle and Zaha plays out wide. So in terms of comparing them to, Zaha is much better playing out wide than Loftus-Cheek is. So if you put Zaha out wide, he can run down the flanks, get in behind and put crosses in whereas lost his cheek he's better playing down the middle because he can drive forward so when Roy Hodgson made that change obviously it improved Zaha's game and the reason I've given him a seven is because how he improved and the something he did do in the second half was starting to put in crosses so I believe really looking back at the game if we had started a game with a 4-3-3 formation and having Zaha out wide putting in balls to Benteke we may have created even more chances in the game but in terms of, you know, the game as a whole, the main reason I'm going to give him a 7 wasn't the best performance from him, but because of how good his second half performance was, uh, that's why I've given, given him a 7. You know, he obviously had the beating of his markers, so he was running in behind, you know, beating West Brom's defenders for pace. But obviously, because West Brom were playing quite well defensively, he was struggled for space, didn't quite have a lot of space playing in them central areas. And that's why, another reason why he needs to play out wide, because he can actually run at players, whereas if you're playing down the middle, it's quite congested. And you can't really get forward too much. But in terms of a few chances he, ha he had. He obviously had a few tame chances saved. And he had another one turned behind for a corner. So unlike Townsend. He had that sort of end product. Which was coming from his running. But obviously. When he was playing up front. He had them chances. But when he was playing out wide. Although he didn't have chances on goal. He actually had the space to obviously roam. Run at the defenders. And you know. He was able to obviously put the ball in for Benteke. But whether he was instructed to or not when it when he was playing against Benteke in the middle of attack he was quite wasted but when he was moved out wide he actually improved quite a lot because he was looking to get balls into Benteke so in terms of Zaha's performance you know much like against you know West Brom um, sorry against Brighton midweek against West Brom it was an average performance from him from him you know no massive skill either way but like I said against Brighton and like I've said for the last few weeks as soon as he moves out wide he improves drastically he starts to put balls in the box so in order for, to get the best out of Zaha in the upcoming games we need to start playing him out wide so he can get crosses in and then play lost of cheek down the middle so he can drive forward but I personally think a 7 is a fair result now to move on to Christian Menteke who I am going to give a 6 still looks rusty but was more involved than in recent weeks probably should have scored at least one with two great chances in the first half he created one for himself with some neat footwork, but couldn't round four stop, and then did well to beat his man for a corner, but headed right at the baggy's keeper. In the second half, he wasn't in the right position for a handful of balls that flashed over in the box, hanging at the back post when he needed to be at the front. So Christian Benteke here, I've given him a six, and much like his performance at Brighton, he's slowly progressively getting better, obviously because he's had six weeks, uh, I believe it was eight weeks actually, six to eight weeks out with injury, so you can expect him to be rusty, but... This game here against West Brom, it was a slight improvement once again on that performance against Brighton. So slowly, slowly, he's getting more involved and looking less rusty as the games go on. And, you know, the more games he plays, you know, some may argue he shouldn't have played 90 minutes. But the more games he plays at the end of the day, the more fit he's going to get and the more potent he's going to get in front of goal. But in terms of this game here, although he's a bit rusty and not necessarily playing to the best of his game, he could have probably have scored at least one goal but he had two great chances to do that and these obviously were in the first half now obviously with him playing alongside Wilf he, they were creating quite a lot of chances for each other and that partnership did work quite a lot in terms of them two but it exploited um, obviously lost his cheek out wide but in terms of that partnership it worked really well and obviously Benteke got a few chances for himself now the first one it was actually superb you know pass from Zaha dribbled past about three players nice footwork got past the challenge had a shot, but obviously with Forster there, Forster was able to beat it away for a corner. So not only was he able to actually get a chance in the box and have a shot, but he was able to take on four players, dribble past three, and obviously avoid a tackle from the other. Then his another great chance, you know, we know how good of a header he is of the ball. There was another chance where from the resulting corner, Benteke 
no one around him, free header, headed it down, but it was straight at Forster. So not only was he having a chance where he got through and go and had a shot and it was saved by Forster, he also was left completely free in the box, had that header down, but nothing really came off of it purely because uh, it was straight at Forster. But the fact that he was able to create these chances and get on the end of them shows that he's slowly becoming better. And if he had been fully fit, he may have finished that header by putting it far post rather than putting it straight in the keeper. But the fact that in the Brighton game we didn't see many chances and when you compare it to this game where he actually had quite a lot of chances and obviously he didn't score them but the fact that he had chances just shows how he's progressively getting better as the games go on. Now in the second half obviously with Wilf moving out wide there were quite a lot of balls getting flashed into the box whether that be from Zaha, whether that be from Townsend the few balls he went in or whether that be from Loftus Cheek so in the second half we were putting on pressure putting balls in the box but obviously you can expect him being a bit rusty he was hanging at the far post at the back post trying to get on the end of them when actually he it would be better for him to be in the middle of the box so he can get a clear head ahead on them so in terms of his second half performance he had them chances in the first half in the second half he could have had even more chances if he had sort of sorted out his positional play so if he had been playing in the middle of the box rather than at the far post or the back post maybe he would have had you know more chances but in terms of getting involved in the game you could argue that this was probably one of his best performances this season you know in terms of his physical presence he was a constant threat to West Brom you know we were pumping balls to him long and he was dealing with them quite well holding them up quite well and obviously he twice he, he you know he forced Forster into a save obviously one with a headed goal and one with the shot so not only showing that he's a physical threat but also if he got a chance on goal whether it be with his head or his foot he can score them but obviously his best chance was that one when he ran in behind three defenders avoided the challenge of the fourth but obviously he couldn't convert that to finish so Christian Benteke here I've given him a six still looks a little bit rusty but you've got to give him a little bit of time to get back to full fitness when you consider he's been out with eight weeks uh, with an injury but in this game, there was quite a lot of, quite a lot of uh, you know, neat footwork to create a chance for himself. But Forster was quite equal to it. And then from the resulting corner, he had a header cleared off the line as well. So he's creating chances for himself. So hopefully in the next few games, his, his performances can improve even more. Now to move on to the sub, Bakary Saku, who I'm not going to give a rating. A late, late replacement for Townsend as Hodgson looked to play out for a point. Put in a very important block at the far post on field. So Bakary Sacco here, I'm not really going to give him a rating because, like I said in that introduction, it was quite a late, late uh, replacement for Townsend. Wasn't really on the pitch long enough to make an impact. But still, he came on the pitch, Townsend wasn't having the best game, and still, he looked a bit lively. You know, he hasn't really played much this season. But in terms of coming off the bench and having an impact, he still had a little bit of an impact because he brought a little bit more energy to the side. But obviously, in terms of the main one important thing he did do, is that Field obviously had a few good chances in the game which Joe Ward blocked. There was a very important block from Sacco which actually stopped Field from scoring. So in terms of making an impact off the bench, he was there to be he was there in the right place at the right time to obviously stop Field from getting that chance. So if you were to say something about his performance, although he obviously didn't really have that much impact on the game, the fact that he made that important block is what kept us in the game and kept it at nil nil. So you've got to give him credit for that. But like I've said already, came on quite late in the game. Obviously, with him being a former Wolves player, we got quite a lot of boos from the home, home side. Obviously, with West Brom being rivals with Wolves, didn't really seem to affect his game. You know, he didn't make any horrendous mistakes because of the booing. And, you know, the only impact he did have was, you know, from Sam Field, that block he did make. But like I've said with Joe Ward, them blocks were quite important because it kept us in the game and kept the game at nil-nil. So, although he didn't have any effect offensively, the fact that he was able to get back and actually make that block from field shows how important his substitution was. So now just to give a small summary of the game, obviously before I go on to talk about my man and match, and in terms of, you know, the last six games, we've only lost once in them last six games, which actually shows that since Roy Hodgson has been appointed, he's starting to, you know, make an influence on the side and actually making us quite a tough side to beat. And when you consider how at the beginning of the season our away form was quite atrocious, we were trying to attack teams, weren't really going right, he's now starting to make us much more defensively solid away from home playing even though he's playing us more attacking uh, at home away from home he's making us play quite defensive making us quite tough to beat and obviously that's seen that actually we haven't been beaten uh, we've been only beaten once in the last six games which shows that actually Roy Hodgson is now starting to have an impact but to be honest 
it's not ideal that we drew this game 0-0 because actually a win would have been better because we would have gone level on points with West Brom. But actually, in terms of the significance of this point, yes, it doesn't move us level with points with the teams above us, but it moves us off the bottom of the table because the likes of Swansea and West Ham lost their games. So they've now gone below us. And actually, that point and the point against Brighton has now brought us off the bottom of the table. And even moving up two positions, that's really going to boost the confidence of the players purely because it now looks we're now in touching distance of teams outside of the relegation zone. And if you look at the teams in the bottom half, so 11th to 20th, there isn't really much difference in between them teams. So if we can continue to put in solid performances and be tough to be tough to beat and pick up points here and there and win a few games, if we can continue to be like that and be tough to play against, then hopefully the points are going to come and the confidence is going to grow. But at the moment, you know, Roy Hodgson's doing a great job, you know, making us difficult to beat. And slowly, slowly, we're climbing up that table. You know, we thought it was an impossible job when he came in. And now we're starting to see the impacts of, obviously, his coaching methods. But in terms of the game, you know, in the build-up to the game, it's not ideal when you lose the likes of Scott Dan, Yoan by James Tonkins. But the late inclusions, obviously, of Marty Kelly, Junior Sproney, obviously rolling back the years, because obviously they haven't played in quite a while. Obviously, Sproney has, but Kelly hasn't. But I still thought that these players who came in last minute actually had quite a lot of influence in the game. So when you consider that actually it was quite a mismatched team in terms of the Palace lineup, the fact that Speroni came in when he weren't meant to start, MacArthur came back into the side, Marty Kelly came into the side. You know, it was a bit of a mi mixed match team because that's not the, the team that we would have expected to start. But actually, these team, these players who came into the team actually put up, put up you know a solid performance and ultimately helped us to the nil nil draw. Now to move on to my Man of the Match award, but before I do that and give you my Man of the Match and why I thought I had the biggest influence on the game, I'm now going to give you the four nominations I put forward for the award. So in quite a dull game, much like the 0-0 draw against Brighton, it's quite a lacklustre game, there's no real attacking threat from either side, so actually it's going to be quite a dull game and it's pretty hard when you've got a 0-0 draw to pick out certain players who shone throughout the game, but in terms of the performance of both West Brom and Palace, both of our defensive players played fantastically well and that is including the goalkeepers. So in terms of this performance, a nil-nil draw, I think it was quite... I wouldn't say it was easy for me to pick out the players who I would put on the shortlist. But it was made easier by the fact that actually going forward we weren't so great. But defensively we, we were really solid throughout the game. And in particular a few players were great, you know, doing their jobs throughout the game. But in terms of the four nominations I've put forward are Julian Sproni, Mamadou Sacco, Joe Ward and Luka Milivojevic. So just to go through why I've put each of the players on the shortlist and obviously why I thought that they're worthy of the Man of the Match award. In terms of Julian Sproni, obviously he produced a fantastic save to deny Jay Rodriguez. So that's the main save he made in the game. You know, if that had gone in, would have been 1-0, probably game over. And then that was obviously in the first half. And then in the second half, he made quite a lot of series of important saves. So once again from Julian Sproni, he wasn't meant to start the game. Obviously Wayne Hennessy was. Wayne Hennessy got injured in the warm-up. Julian Sproni came in, showed how professional he was, got on with his job. And there were certain points in the game where he made these saves. And the, the one for me that was the best save was the one against uh, Jay Rodriguez. But in terms of the game as a whole, there were loads of important saves throughout. Obviously, Mamadou Sacco, the captain again, he obviously captained the Eagles quite well. I thought he, he'd done really well to command the side and make sure everyone knew their place. In terms of his defensive performance, I thought he had great composure. And then there was quite a lot, much like Spironi with his saves, there was quite a lot of important interceptions that Sacco made throughout the game. And that's what put him higher than, say, some of the other players on the pitch, is the fact that how important what he did was and obviously in his case being a defender it was his interceptions which were quite crucial in terms of you know keeping the game at nil nil getting that clean sheet and when you consider he's been the captain two clean sheets in a row two you know um yeah two points away from home uh not bad going so Sacco doing quite well as a captain in terms of Joe Ward this guy was absolutely phenomenal in the game in terms of a word to describe how he was defensively, he was resolute, done nothing wrong throughout the game, he was making blocks and tackles all over the pitch. And in terms of three blocks in particular, much like Speroni's saves, they were absolutely important. If it weren't for them blocks, maybe we would have lost 2-3-0, but purely because of how many chances they had down that down that uh, left-hand fl left flank. But Joe Ward was literally, like I said, resolute in defence. He was making blocks, making tackles, putting himself in front of players to 
get the ball away and act as a shield almost. And then in terms of tackles, getting in behind, getting the ball off the opponent and, you know, going forward. And although he wasn't great going forward, at least he'd done that defensive work by actually getting the ball and then getting it away out of danger. And then the final player, who once again is a sort of defensive player, and that's Luka Milivojevic playing in that defensive midfield role. You know, it's, I always re almost repeat myself every week, but it was another solid performance from him. Much like Sako, he had great composure on the ball. And quite a lot of the time, obviously with Luka playing quite defensive, quite a lot in this game, he went forward and there was quite a few effective forward passes. So much like, you know, a few weeks ago where I said he was starting to venture forward and having shots from the edge of the box. In this game again here, although he was calm in possession and done a good defensive job, in terms of going forward, he can actually ping a uh, quite a good pass and in terms of a word to describe his performance you could use the word solid but I suppose you could use fine as well because I thought it was absolutely fine-tuned performance no real errors but absolutely fantastic class from him but in terms of these players obviously they're all sort of defensive players and that's why I've put them in the shortlist for the Man of the Match award when you consider this nil-nil draw both teams playing quite well defensively so you're going to have to nominate these players or defensive players to actually win the award and I thought because we were so good defensively and because these players really shone for me you know looking back at the game these were quite crucial players in terms of keeping that clean sheet I think they all deserve to be on the shortlist but for me and you've probably seen this on Twitter already but there is one standout winner so Joe Ward uh, congratulations to you you win my man of the match award for the game against West Brom and you know you don't get a trophy or certificate but you do get my sincere congratulations on what was another solid resolute performance from you but to be honest, the main reason I've put him on the shortlist, you know, it was between him and Speroni for me personally. Obviously, Speroni made all of them important saves. But Joe Ward, he was obviously pretty good in defence anyway. But for them, sort of two or three important blocks he made to keep the, the game at nil-nil. For that alone, I've put him, you know, actually as my man of the match. So not because I thought that Speroni's saves were less important, but just purely because of how many times Joe Ward got in behind, made himself a shield and actually made them blocks and for the amount of times also that he actually, you know, even when he was under pressure, he'd go back, make that tackle and clear the danger. So all of these players done really well defensively, you know, Speroni with the saves, Ward with them tackles and blocks, Sacco just being calm and composed with his interceptions and then Luca just for his overall defensive play and his forward passes. But all of these plays done well. But for me, Joe Ward, for them blocks and tackles he made all over the field, uh, that's why he's won my Man of the Match award. So now you've heard my match report, player rankings and my Man of the Match. That concludes this week's podcast. Now I've got interviews with Roy Hodgson and Julian Sproni following the game. Julian, do you think that was a deserved point today for Crystal Palace? Yeah, it was a tough game. It was a very tough game. Uh, both teams were really hard and uh, it was a tough... You know, we were really hard for the point. Uh, we could have got three. But I think we, we should be pleased with the, with the point here. Obviously, you did well today, but it was an interesting afternoon. You weren't in the starting eleven, and then you were. Talk us through your day. Yeah, I mean, but you had to prepare. You know, you never know what's going to happen. So, you know, I've done that you know, all my career. You know, I always try to prepare well for, you know, whatever happens. Uh, you know, I'll be ready to, to, to play and to do well for the team. Back-to-back -back clean sheets. Crystal Palace hadn't had any all season until the draw at Brighton. Does that show you're moving in the right direction defensively? Mm. Yeah, I mean, we've been working really hard for that. We, we try to be solid in the back and then try to, you know, score goals you know, as many as we can. And, um, but, yeah, I mean, we, the team performed really well today, defensively, but collectively, not just the back four and myself, but the whole team collectively performed well today. And as things stand, Palace will be moving off the bottom of the table. Psychologically, how important is that for you as well? I know, but, yeah, we haven't done anything yet, so we need to carry on in the same way. We are in a good run at the moment, but we need to make sure we continue to work the way we are at the moment and, uh, and yeah, see what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Roy, uh, two clean sheets in the space of a week away from home, a couple of points on the road. I mean, th this is progress, isn't it? I think so, and especially in this particular circumstance because we had a scenario where everything that could go wrong did go wrong, you know, not least of all sitting for hours and hours on a train that was, was stuck on the tracks just outside of Euston Station and uh, arriving at half past nine instead of five o'clock. And then, of course, to losing Scott down overnight and then the goalkeeper in the warm-up add to the fact that we had Tomkins and Kabai out from yesterday's training. So basically the scenario couldn't really have been much worse uh, going into the game, but during the game and now after the game, I've got to say I'm really pleased with the way that the players who 
put the shirts on today, did their jobs, and we got a, what, I, what I consider to be a well-deserved and a, a valuable point. It did leave you a little bit short, didn't it? A couple of spare seats on the yeah. bench today. Um, yes, well, it's amazing. So we had a game last night for some of the players who've not played for a while, so you know, we thought we'd just take the 18 on this occasion. Uh, and we end up with 16. But to be honest, I mean, it, the 18s, it's, it's a comfort zone. You, you very rarely need that many subs. You know, you're oft, you've often got three that you've got in mind who are more likely to play. So uh, the goalkeeper one was the problem, of course. We were lucky that nothing happened to Spironi. Otherwise, I don't know who would have played in goal. Maybe even you. Um, <laughs> well, then... But it would be quite as bad as that. <laughs> um, Speroni got through the game fine. Clean sheet for him, clearly. Was it, just quickly, was it a, was it back spasm for, for Wayne Hennessy? Yeah. yeah, he went out to, to war and suddenly his back went into spasm. It's not the first time it's happened. He told me that before the first game in the Euros it happened to him, so he missed that game. So uh, we've, we're, we're not blessed with back spasms. We've had Ruben Loftus-Cheek and now Hennessy. What about the match itself? Not an awful lot in it, not too many chances at either end. No, no. I thought that some of our play in the first half, the quality of our play was good. I thought that we certainly asked a lot of questions. Uh, A little bit disappointed that we didn't get a penalty. I think that, you know, when Wilf Zaha was brought down by by Ben Foster. So uh, that's a little bit unlucky for us. We've not been lucky there either. But uh, I think... Uh, Neil Neil was probably a fair result over the over the uh, ninety minutes because neither team, as you say, really dominated it for long spells. You're off the bottom, two off the bottom, Are we? Um, still three points short of safety. But in general, the position looks a bit healthier. You know, you're right in the mix now, aren't you, to, to potentially get out of this? Yeah, I think we are. And we said all along, my staff and I, that the important thing is. When the new year begins, uh, or we get the January transfer window over, we want to be in a situation where we're in contact. We don't want to be as divorced as we were after seven games where it looked quite hopeless. As long as we can stay in that mix and stay within a reasonable number of points, we believe that the way the lads are playing and the work that they're, they're doing will pay dividends. I think we've got better over these last eight games. and. Uh, We've got the points to prove that, because in the last eight games we've taken ten points, which is a lot better. Finally, a word about your reception here. You had a, a good time when you were the manager here a few years ago, and I couldn't help but notice that, unlike the weather, it looked a decidedly warm one at the start of the match and at the end. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I really enjoyed my time at West Bromwich. I mean, it's a really good club. I enjoyed working with the players, uh, the staff, the fans. Of, I think uh, are, are very, very good. We're lucky at Crystal Palace. We've got great fans too. But to get that sort of reception as the away manager, that was very, very special, very touching, of course. I'm really grateful for it. And it's something which uh, has probably put the biggest smile on my face for a long time. So there you have it. Now you've heard what Roy Hodgson and Julian Sproni had to say after the game. That concludes this week's podcast for the game against West Brom. But make sure to come out next week for my post-match review of the game against Bournemouth. So thanks for listening and remember to up the palace.